And um, I was thinking about the work of two other artists. Um, Martin Wong is the third artist in the exhibition, and he's the painter in the exhibition. And um, Ai Weiwei, of course, probably all of you know about him. Um, if not uh, his artistic work and him as a public figure, as a political activist. Um, and of course, uh, you know, I knew about their New York period. Um, and so somehow all of these four figures who are of Chinese heritage but come from four different places, um, which are mainland China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and San Francisco. Martin Wong was a third generation Chinese American. And, and then I realized that they were all in New York, which in, in these heady years of the 1980s. And so the question became, did they know each other? These are four people who are discussed in art history in completely different contexts. You know, they were almost never talked about in relation to each other. So it became a question of, could there be possible alternative history of personal connections between them? So that's what's suggested in the subtitle of the exhibition, of History of Possible Encounters. And we called it Possible Encounters because at that, at the beginning and even during the course of organizing the exhibitions, we didn't know if there was a connection between these artists. So this was really an attempt to um, do a bit of excavation and try to write an alternative um, to the established art historical narratives. So that was the beginning of it. And then, I'm sorry, am I just going on no, and on? No, no. Um, and somehow, um, a few months later, I found myself in Hong Kong again for a different event. And Kusumian, whom I uh, had known uh, in Europe, um, showed up there. And then that was the moment that he was announced as the director of Parasite, which is a great, um, originally artist run organization that's been around now for 17 years and it's um, indisputably the most important space of contemporary art in Hong Kong, which is now still a very much growing, evolving city uh, in terms of contemporary art. Um, and, um, and when, so, so we reconnected in Hong Kong and somehow in the course of our conversation, um, again, a dinner conversation, I somehow mentioned this, um, that this has become a new sort of art historical obsession for me. Um, and one of these days I will find time to do some research and maybe I will write an essay about it. And then he just stared at me, he went, why don't you do an exhibition and why don't you do it at Parasite? So that became the sort of second stage of the development of this idea. Um, and the second stage being idea turning into an exhibition um, and, and then followed by several months of now um, almost kind of collaborative, re well, it is definitely collaborative research that was also something of detective work because I you know, am based in New York and he's in Hong Kong now, so there were certain things that he could find out that I couldn't and vice versa. Um, so that's how we sort of put together this exhibition like um, a kind of a puzzle work. Yes, and I guess um, I mean speaking about this uh, this period of research and the and the very beginning of the exhibition, we I guess at the at the very beginning of the process we were open to significantly more speculation and and, and even um, well even fiction. Uh, I think there was a very clear uh, crit critique of a particular kind of like uh, art historical. Um, uh, approach in, 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 in uh, exhibition making and, and of a particular way of using the medium of exhibition making to, to write art history and there was, I think this is an important component of the exhibition, we can talk maybe later about it, of, of, of you know, besides the subject matter of the exhibition and the particular history of, of, of these four individuals and even beyond the context that they were describing, this is also an exhibition about a method uh, and the method of, of writing history through uh, exhibition makings. And I think there, uh, uh, there's a number of, of critiques that are embedded in this, um, in, this um, uh, in the narrative of the exhibition. 
but this has evolved because again at the beginning uh, well at the end it turned out more art historically sound than we actually <laughs> wanted at the beginning because a lot of the fiction and speculation actually proved to be um, well not there and you know the, I think the best example for me is the fact that we had no idea that there was any interaction between Martin Wong and Ai Weiwei, for example. We had no proof at the beginning of the, the process. And then while meeting Ai Weiwei, he you know, was very touched because Martin was one of his closest friends in, in, in New York, like one of the person, or at, at least one of the persons with whom he had like some of the most, um, I think, personal conversations. And Martin did a painting, especially for Ai Weiwei, which he still has. Yeah. somewhere, we couldn't locate it, but apparently it exists. Um, so, you know, we were ready to just have a, a speculative association between these figures and to almost tell a fictional story that would have worked, you know, at a, at a different level, but that was also not necessary a little bit because things actually proved to be more closely knit to each other yeah. than, um, than we imagined. Should we talk about the artists just briefly? Maybe you can start with Martin. Yeah, so the exhibition that you um, will see or have seen upstairs uh, essentially consists of... <laughs> consists of um, four sections, one each dedicated to each artist, um, but somewhat woven together. Um, and then there is uh, a timeline that was put together to, um, again, mix uh, biographical data as well as some other contextual information which we can go into briefly. And then this, uh, we'll talk more in detail about how um, this timeline is a new element that was introduced to this second presentation. We just have very few images. Um, we uh, didn't assume that um, any of these four names are uh, familiar to the audience here. Um, but we don't want to go into too much detail about it because there's a lot of information upstairs. But briefly, um, Martin Wong, um, you see here, uh, is, was born in San Francisco um, and grew up there. Um, and he actually didn't leave the San Francisco Bay Area, area until he was uh, 28 years old. Um, and he was very much of that, that generation of the 1960s of, uh, you know, he's essentially a San Francisco flower child, right? You know, uh, very much part of the hippie generation. In fact, lived uh, for a number of years in his 20s in a commune in the Haight-Ashbury district in San Francisco. And that picture that you see on the left is during the time he was the artistic director for a radical drag troupe, performance troupe called Angels of Light. Um, so he served as the artistic director there. In 1978, he decided that he was going to move to uh, from San Francisco to New York to become, quote unquote, serious painter. He was clearly an artistic child, and he studied architecture and ceramics, and he was doing all kinds of artistic things, including doing things uh, with performance groups and theaters, but he had never really seriously tried his hand on painting. Um, and so the image on the right is um, him now in New York. Uh, this is probably circa 1985 or so, based on that not the painting that he's working on at the moment, but the one behind it, which is called Sweet Oblivion, a, pain, a very large painting from 1985. Anyway, so this picture shows you some of the elements that he became very well known for. Um, that uh, red brick tenement buildings that you see in East Village and Lower East Side, um, which you know, have seen waves of immigration uh, for decades, um, and that's what really built New York, um, and perhaps you can even say the United States. Um, and also the painting that he's working on at the moment, it shows uh, uh, alternate, alternately called hand signal or finger spelling for uh, the hearing impaired. So these, and also on the same painting, these uh, star constellations, these became his signature elements, and he soon um, within a few years of his arrival in New York in 1978, uh, found um, actually you could say success and um, reputation in the Lower East art scene as a very unique kind of a figurative painter. Um, he was very sensitive and perceptive to 
the local environment and the physical environment in the sense that this was when New York was in many ways devastated physically um, from poverty, homelessness, and the drug, drug problem. Um, and really East Village and Lower East Side, you could see these empty lots with demolished buildings and full of refuse. Um, but he really embraced this context of East Village. It wasn't just a place that was devastated, but it was full of vitality. Um, this was the time that, you know, um, uh, you know, all kinds of artists who have been previously disenfranchised and marginalized, right? Artists of color, um, gay and lesbian artists, um, and graffiti artists, all of them found home in East Village, and he felt very much at home. Um, so this was the story of Martin. Um, and I think just briefly, uh, I mentioned that he was a third generation Chinese um, American from San Francisco. Both of his parents were uh, American born, um, born Chinese American as well. So he was through and through American, you know, of that particular generation of the 1960s. But there was a certain yearning that he had uh, towards, um, you know, having some sort of a connection to his heritage. Um, he had that within his house, uh, home environment, but he never learned to speak Chinese, and um, he lamented that fact for the rest of his, you know, uh, during the time that he lived. Uh, and I should just um, also mention that he was diagnosed with AIDS-related. Um, illness in 1994 and died in 1999. So he's the only artist who is no longer living in this exhibition. And I think now uh, to, to jump to uh, another artist in the exhibition which had somehow uh, uh, in, in, in many ways like you know, some of the most different experiences and that's just probably our way, uh, who is the youngest artists in the exhibition, I think it's also important to know because this will influence uh, a few of his positions within, within also like within the curatorial decisions of, of presenting him in the show. Uh, he was born as the son of one of the most important poets of modern China. Uh, he's really like a, 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 a great figure who was none that he was born, who was nonetheless um, um, forced to relocate in the countryside when uh, Wei Wei was very young, like uh, just a few, month, uh, a few months old. So he basically grew up and spent his entire uh, childhood and, and teenage years um, in, in several small villages in the um, west of China and, and Inner Mongolia. Uh, he returns to Beijing in the, in the late 70s uh, with his entire family, so with the opening of the of the regime after Mao's death, um, the people who were forced to relocate were uh, obviously allowed to move back to the cities. Um, he enrolls in the um, in the in the film school in, in, in Beijing, and he's actually a colleague of with uh, um, you know a stellar generation of, of, of directors, and he's uh, actually hanging out in that environment. You know. To tell it bluntly, that doesn't mean that it that, that had like very few repercussions in a way, uh, perhaps on, on, on his practice. Um, then the first moment when I think he's really entering uh, an art historical narrative is actually at, the, at one of the moments that can be conventionally considered to be the beginning of, of, of contemporary art in China, simply because of not so much in terms of like the formal um, aspects of, of, of the art that was produced around that moment, but rather because of the um, position of critique and of, 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 of an institutional discussion around that moment. And I refer to the Star Group exhibition um, very briefly about it, that uh, a group of artists was rejected from showing in, at the um, China Art Gallery uh, in 1979, decided to install their works uh, in a park at the entrance of this very officially otherwise uh, institution in Beijing, that up until that moment was mainly showing social realist art. It's very important because that continued in China way uh, longer and way more rigidly than uh, definitely in the Soviet Union. So decades after that stopped being uh, the official narrative in, in uh, the rest of the, of the Eastern Bloc. Um, so they... Um, this exhibition was installed in, in, in the park. Um, the the, the um, 
exhibition was taken down by the, by the police. They staged a demonstration, which was in fact the first spontaneous demonstration in China after the proclamation of the People's Republic, which is very interesting because, you know, it was done by a bunch of artists who were primarily shouting for uh, artistic freedom, but there were other shouts that were uh, included in this, uh, um, uh, among their slogans. Uh, they were eventually allowed to hold their exhibition uh, in, the, in the China Art Gallery, uh, and then because this was successful, they were allowed to no, uh, they were allowed to hold a second one. Now, the second one was primarily allowed to happen because uh, the uh, um, officials considered this were, you know, the, the, the final discreditation of the group. However, the exhibition brought 200,000 visitors in two weeks. Uh, but it was open, and this really, in many ways, shattered a lot of the um, things that were taken for granted in, in Chinese uh, art until that moment. And I've already participated in this exhibition with uh, several watercolors. We show the reproduction of three of them in the, in the timeline upstairs. Uh, the originals are lost. They were thrown away by his mother while he was in New York. Um, now, what's very important about these watercolors, and I'll be quick about it, is that even if their outlook is terribly conservative, uh, they were definitely part of a, a very rebellious period that was shared among uh, all the members of the of the stars group in each in which a kind of manifestation of, of uh, artistic subjectivity was a way of making a political stand and in a way choosing one's own language uh, from the from the canonic history of Western art of the of the 19th and 20th century was a, a statement of individualism in a way that was regarded by themselves very actively as, as being a, a, a political gesture. So we're definitely not showing it in order to discard. I have a way to show you know, that there's, there has been a very conservative uh, 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 moment in his practice, but in a way, on the contrary, to say that he has been coherently connected to different moments of, of you know, rebellion and change, uh, even if the forms through this happened, uh, 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 changed throughout the time. Um, it's important to say that he was a rather marginal member of the STARS group, also because of his age, he was very young, he was one of the youngest participants. Uh, soon after, he moved to New York to study uh, design and film at, at uh, Parsons. He drops out very soon after. Um, and then in the 10 years that he spends in New York, he's perhaps the least successful of all the four in that, in that time, and then he actually returns to Beijing in 93 without having really made a career for himself in New York. But as one can see from the uh, photographs that he took in his time, and he took compulsively uh, um, thousands and tens of thousands of, of photographs, things that he did not actually regard as, as an artistic practice at the time. He was more interested in, in, in abandoning painting for some sort of like conceptual practice. This was for him just a practice of the everyday of, I guess, consuming the city in this new world in which he, was, he found himself in. But I think this is, for me, the moment when you can actually see the Iowa way of today um, in, in his incredible historical savviness. I mean, this very young immigrant who spoke very bad English and had very little exposure and contact with the, with the, with the world, except in a very, I guess, disseminated way from his father's library in the countryside in China. But nonetheless, he had, um, I guess, the, the, the spirit and the intuition to be at the core moments, at the, at the nexus moments in New York of those ten, in, in those 10 years. Uh, he was there at the, at the you know, first ACT UP uh, demonstrations. He was there with Al Sharpton when he was demonstrating. Uh, he, he became a friend of Anne Ginsberg. And I think it's also very important you know, to see that there's another genesis for his kind of like beat punk kind of spirit of rebellion. Um, he was there at all the anti gentrification protests. He was there. Uh, we actually show images from. A uh, number of uh, left-wing demonstrations in New York in 1989, at which he participated. So, while uh, another ideologically ambiguous demonstration was happening in China at the time in Tiananmen, he was experiencing a different form of a people and a different form of political awareness. But in 
in the States. Um, he's taking like, a close-up image of, of Bill Clinton in the last stages of his campaign before he actually gets elected. So I think that shows very much who he will become, and that shows very much somehow the genesis of, of, of Iowa Bay of today. And um, yeah, so that's the, the core of like what we're showing in the exhibition, those images. But we also show uh, a few objects, and two of them are actually world premiere at SALT, and they were um, recently produced, and there are two objects that are done in, conjun in conjunction to his um, recent political biography and of, uh, with, with his imprisonment. Um, and for us, it's important, again, to see, to show the genesis of um, Iowa Way, the political personality and the, and the public intellectual, and then, you know, through, through these images and then these objects that he connected to his current uh, life. So, you know, maybe you have been uh, following at least um, tangentially um, this ongoing saga of Ai Weiwei, but, um, you know, those of you who are not familiar, just to kind of summarize it really briefly, that this whole thing started uh, when he uh, resigned in protest. Uh, he was originally selected to uh, designed the Olympic Stadium in Beijing for the 2008 Olympics with um, Jacques Herzog and Pierre de Meuron. Um, and then he resigned from that role in protest against the Chinese government's dismal records um, in terms of human rights. And then he continued his activism, and which resulted in his incarceration in the last couple of years. He still cannot travel outside of um, China. And um, you, you know, it, despite the, the censorship and media repression that's ongoing in China, there is a quite active um, internet-based discussions that are happening. And um, of course, you know, many people are very supportive of him, but other people are very critical of him. And one of the criticisms um, that are uh, thrown at him is that he's too American. Right, you know, because he's talking about freedom of expression and civil rights, and you know, these are very um, American ideas. And then these citizens, Chinese netizens, who um, are not, who don't feel positive about Ai Weiwei, would say something like, "If you like America so much, then why don't you go back?" Right? You know, these this is the kind of things that um, the many Chinese people would say. Um, so in that context, it is really interesting to think about. In many ways, he was formed in the United States and in New York because he really spent the you know, first decade and a half of his adult life there, which is really truly formative years, right? So are there some truth to that, that when you say that perhaps he is a very American figure? But that's not really what we wanted to suggest here. Uh, more in generally, why is it that these, again, four artists of Chinese heritage, but coming from different places, gravitated to New York in the 1980s, which wasn't the prettiest place at the time. I mean, again, it was riddled with so many problems, but it still represented um, a kind of a utopian space for them. So the third artist in the exhibition, we don't have an image right here, but you can certainly see his work in the exhibition, is again named Teqing She. Um, and she was originally from Taiwan, um, and he was a, a high school graduate who was never formally trained in, in art, and he um, got a job on one of those giant oil tankers that you know, traveled from Taiwan to Iran and somehow made a stop in Philadelphia when it he... Was before 79, so... Uh, oh, before before, it was 79, before, before so 79, so... Tankers was, yeah. were still circulating directly from Iran to the States. Right. Um, and then when the ship temporarily docked in Philadelphia, he jumped ship, literally. And he, um, I guess, had made some money while he was working on the ship. And he had no idea. I mean, this is how uh, New York represented this abstract notion of utopia, right? Um, he had no idea how far Philadelphia to New York was, which isn't far. But nobody takes taxi between Philadelphia and New York, which is what he did. So he blew off $150 at this time, and this was 1974 or 75, so you know, that was a lot of money at the time. Um, but he made the decision to 
move to New York and live as an illegal immigrant, which meant that he could only get jobs as dishwasher and these kinds of menial jobs in Chinatown in New York. And he lived in that stat status for a number of years. Um, and in fact, I think he started his first legendary performance in 1978 while he was a still an illegal immigrant. So this is a series of performances I'm talking about is called One Year Performance. And that's exactly what it is. It's a performance that lasts for a year. Um, the first one was done in 1978, and he does six of them um, until about mid-1980s. It wasn't every single year. Um, I think he had to take breaks every once in a while because he had to make a living. Um, and the one that you see upstairs, um, I believe is the third in the series. Um, and you know, this is going to be pretty self-explanatory, but he uh, vows to not go inside any building or any vehicle for a whole year. So, but the very first one was he constructed a cage inside his studio and he never left the cage for a whole year. Um, but he needed help from the community of people um, to bring food to him and to take away the refuse that was produced. Um, and then, um, so going back to the original inspiration of their of wondering about what we're discovering that there is a connection between this artist teaching Xie, you know, uh, the way that his performances are talked about, um, either cage piece or one year outdoor piece, is as this kind of Herculean effort of this kind of mysterious figure who performs this superhuman task, right? Um, and he really was a huge inspiration, has been a huge inspiration for many performance artists um, who are especially interested in this kind of endurance piece. Um, but then when I heard in Hong Kong two and a half years ago that the fourth artist that we're going to talk about, uh, Fra King Kwok, was one of the people who brought him food for the first piece, then, it be, you, know, then you have faces to this kind of support net network that was necessary, right? And then this Taiwanese um, immigrant who had been in New York only for a few years, again, still illegal immigrant, made, working in menial jobs, and now turning that experience of working in underground economy, which meant he was probably working 12 hours a day or whatever, into an art form meant that he also had to rely upon that kind of uh, informal network of people like himself, um, which included um, Fra King Kwok. Yes, and um, before actually starting about uh, Fra King, um, you know, I think that the issue that you mentioned is was very important when putting the exhibition of like trying to identify precisely what kind of influence that this this moment of, 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 of life that they spend in, in New York, what did, what did that actually mean in their in their life and in their work? To what extent was that they were clearly, you know, formative years in many ways, but I think we tried to make it as a half thesis to, to point that a lot of the at least very general lines of their artistic personality were formed in their respective contexts before arriving to New York, you know. Um, and with Ai Weiwei, I think that was part of the idea of like showing this bizarre and paradoxical, but in fact not so much uh, you know, participation in the in the stars group. Um, with teaching, if you have the patience to watch the fragment of the of of, of a conversation he had at the at the, at the conference where, where Dorian, at which Dorian participated, he mentioned that organized by AA, um, where he actually mentions a. a, a the evolution of his practice while being in, in Taiwan uh, from, you know, rather generic expressionistic painting that he did in his early 20s, moving towards abstraction. Uh, he shows the last paintings he ever did, which are, you know, uh, red dots on white surface, more or less. Uh, and then there was a... Um, the next logical step was uh, the first performance he ever did, which was to throw himself from the second story of a building in, in Taiwan. I kind of like, you know, if climb without uh, photo montage, so he actually fell and, and broke his uh, feet. So he was from that, you know, and this is, you know, the last, also the, the, the first 
uh, gesture he did after abandoning painting. It was the last gesture he did in Taiwan because, in a way, his decision to leave Taiwan and move to the States is part of this continuum from abandoning painting or from, from moving towards abstraction to moving to this kind of extreme performance uh, and then to finally um, affect his life uh, by, by relocation to the States. In a way, he's the most and one of the most uh, iconic avant-garde figures of the 20th century, um, I, I would say so. I mean, he's in a way the uh, most absolute and perfect embodiment of the avant-garde ideal. But OK, um, and then Frocking. Frocking, who uh, is a very particular character, he's indeed a kind of a heterosexual drag queen uh, of sorts. Um, but a, a hugely important figure in, in Hong Kong for many reasons. Um, as we again show in the timeline, he was organizing something from 1974 in his studio in, um, in the outskirts of Hong Kong, uh, a series of conceptual art exhibitions, being the first one to um, start working in this language in the, in the, in the territory. Um, he, uh, yeah, he continued that throughout the 70s. He was also known as a kind of like contrarian figure, as a, an almost punk avant lettre kind of figure. He's known for having uh, shown a very um, scandalous work at the beginning, at the opening of the Hong Kong Art Center in 1977 and so on. So before moving to the States, he had this um, um, uh, quite well crafted this identity of a, of a, um, of a rebellious artist and, and individuals. Uh, in New York, like all the other artists, he does a lot of jobs, different jobs to support himself. He designs Chinese restaurants. Uh, he works on um, film sets. We show fragments from one of the films in which he provided the art direction, sort of included uh, Unconspicuously in the in the film elements of his practice and of his graffiti art, um, he um, you know does practice at the border of, of performance and and, and uh, you know producing props and and, and uh, um, objects needed to to carry out his his performances. And perhaps most importantly, in the middle of the eighties, he opens a gallery, a core gallery, which is was really one of these, you know, otherwise many uh, spaces in New York that, were, that offered, that, that were really the nexus of different communities and of different networks of people coming together. So um, it wasn't the main center of Hong Kong, it was the, of New York, sorry, it wasn't um, the uh, legendary space of the middle of the, ninth of the, of the 80s in, in Soho, but it was one of the essential ones, one of the many that did actually support the scene, uh, and, and a scene that was, you know, meant something very differently than, than it means today. Uh, it meant much more of a community, of a, of a kind of a bohemian family, of a kind of a, um, a system of, of, of exchange of ideas, of, of objects, of, of affect. So, um, and that's, you know, the main way in which we try to represent him in the exhibition through that action of, of you know, supporting a community um, around him. So, what we wanted to do in the exhibition, um, you know, again, it was uh, both physicalization and speculation um, of these four different strands, if you will, of contemporary art history, right? Um, uh, there's contemporary Chinese art history, you know, which has been getting uh, a lot of attention because of the kind of explosive market around Chinese art in the last couple of decades, perhaps comparable to, you know, uh, maybe Turkish art scene is experiencing in more recent years. I don't know exactly, but this has been happening in different places, China, India, Turkey, or many perhaps you could even say Mexico, uh, the way that the, uh, this kind of neoliberalist neo um, art market works. Um, so that is treated as its own field. Um, and Hong Kong, um, when you look at its art history, having been perhaps a kind of an island 
um, against this country, you know, enormous country of China that has been quote unquote closed for many years um, under uh, the uh, under the you know during the years of Mao um, had its own. It was a, a kind of an island situation. You know, had its own development history. Um, you know, Taiching doesn't really represent the art history of Taiwan. Again, um, he was so uh, divorced from his original context, uh, the way, uh, in the way that his work is discussed. Uh, he's really a figure um, that is uh, part of the history of performance art and very much New York centered. Um, and Martin um, is either talked about in terms of uh, the history of um, New York art in the 1980s, especially downtown scene, or as part of Asian American art history. So these are very different stories, but it was, uh, I mean, this is how history is written, right? I mean, it takes a particular angle, and it, while it pays attention to connections to people, um, it selects and often erases the connections that are there, and that's what we hope to establish in this exhibition. Um, in an alternative way. And I think we should close pretty soon, but I just wanted to say a few words about the title, in case you're wondering. Um, um, Taiping Tianguo um, is the literally translated as uh, eternal peace of heavenly kingdom. Um, and this was the name of the political entity that um, was set up by the Taiping Rebellion in the mid-19th century. So Taiping Rebellion was started by um, a man who thought of himself as a messiah. Um, he thought of himself as the younger brother of Jesus Christ. Um, I mean, Chinese man from southern China. Um, and China, the Qing dynasty of this time had already been greatly weakened by two opium wars. Um, and there were Western powers, British, French, German, Russian, and Americans. Uh, were on the coast of China and greatly weakening uh, the nation. And also there is an internal corruption that has been going on for centuries. So, so this dynasty had already been quite weakened. But in southern China, this um, uh, some sort of a visionary, I guess, um, started this movement, a, a kind of a new religious movement called Taiping, movement and it gathered a huge millions and millions of people who had been left destitute by the corrupt Qing dynasty and in fact um, um, pretty much topple the whole dynasty because you know they essentially took over the southern half of the nation but um, historically ultimately what happened is that because they further weakened um, China that it opened the door to semi-colonization um, and that really is, in many ways, at the roots of um, you know the current Chinese way of looking at the world. You know, certain this great sense of injustice that had been done to China at the time. But the way that we wanted to think about this is um, at least in a couple of different ways. That um, by borrowing this nineteenth-century historical event and this term as um, a, as a signifying this com uh, combination of chaos and utopia at the same time. Um, and we felt that that's what New York in the 1980s represented for these people, for the four artists who were there. They didn't necessarily know what they were going to find when, we, when they get there, but they somehow knew that they had to make this detour. Um, and in the case of Te Ching, it was never a detour. He f uh, permanently uh, reinstalled himself and you know he is very much a New York person now. Um, so you know we kind of also wanted to connect this Chinese kind of a worldview that emerged in the 19th century that is very much a uh, foundation of uh, China's relationship with the rest of the world now. Um, and this one particular moment in art history in New York which uh, has really uh, been the center of um, not just Western, but I guess you could even say the general art historical narrative for the last, since the second half of the 20th century, but looking at it from a very particular point of view of these four artists, again, artists of color, artists of Chinese heritage, 
who were very much on the periphery at the same time. But can we actually look at their time together in New York in one decade and have a, a global implications? Um, again, they are representing so many, so much larger stories at this moment. Um, so this was the kind of a larger, I guess you can call it ambition that we had um, in putting together this exhibition. And now it's in Istanbul. Yes, and I think that this is exactly what is, uh, you know, what I, what I would like to underline before we open into the questions, because there is indeed a different character in this exhibition, uh, and that is the time in which this is happening. And this is a very historical exhibition, and not so much because of the artists involved or, or the, the time when the, when the works were produced, but because the world that is being described in the exhibition is... Uh, a world that is over in many ways, and it is uh, a historical period that uh, um, that has ended, and we can safely say that we live in in, in, in in a new one. So, the situation of artists from you know, in this case mainly around China, but from pretty much everywhere where where this was uh, doable, um, would would aspire to move to to a place like New York to be in the center of, of the art world, to make a career, to be recognized as proper artists, as, as Martin wanted, as, as, as serious artists, um, was very much a function of, of a particular historical moment when a particular kind of um, hegemonic structure was in place uh, with New York at the, at, the, at the top of this nexus. And Pretty much, one can say that this was the last decade in which this was this was the case. I think with the, with the end of the 80s and, and, and the last two decades, really meant in many ways uh, the end of this uh, uh, axis of, 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 of geography. And I would say that this is particularly relevant for this uh, exhibition uh, and for this effort. And this is maybe. You know, there's a, there's a lot of irony here, and there's a lot of melancholy in it as well, I guess, depends on from which angle you look at it, but um, it's certainly interesting that this exhibition with this historical uh, sectioning within it uh, is generated in Hong Kong and travels to Istanbul because I think these two cities um, are in many ways emblematic for this new world and for this new historical moment in which... Um, you know, a certain kind of like hegemonic uh, uh, position by, by a city like New York has been dislocated and shared and reaccumulated around other centers in the world. And again, these two cities seem to be uh, doing a pretty job in reaccumulating power around themselves. And there's something to be celebrated here, it's something to be critical about because it's another manifestation of power and of, of hegemony. But um, um, yeah, it's important to say. And um, so, you know, uh, I guess this is also like a good beginning to thank Saul for this absolutely wonderful collaboration. You know, the alliance of two cities that are, uh, you know, the, the newcomers. Um, but yes, the uh, collaboration has been uh, truly remarkable. And I would also like want to say the, really the last thing because uh, there was a lot of discussion about the um, um, structure of the exhibition and what does it actually mean. Uh, it is not a touring exhibition in the classical sense of the, of the word. Uh, we have a lot of works that were shown here that were not shown in, in Hong Kong. Uh, there's the timeline that was adapted specifically for the context here. Uh, but this is not even the most important part because I would like to emphasize that even the works that were shown in, in Hong Kong and were shown here, each and, and every single work has been reimagined and re-thought through before they were shown in Istanbul. So the show has been curated again with uh, the context and the public of Istanbul in mind. So, yeah. Maybe if that. people have questions or comments. Shy audience. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the super lucid, um, elegant talk. Um, I just very brief, very brief question, perhaps a technical question. You may say, is that when you were doing the research, uh, did you rely on particular like New York 
resources and resources like the downtown archive that NYU has was that uh, I mean were they written into the downtown archive as well? I mean Teaching Chain is obviously was obviously obviously a major character in, in New York during the during the time he was doing his performances, but I mean he came to I guess to light, especially with his performance I believe at Linda Montana. But uh, other than that he was quite well known. Uh, but where did you uh, where did you find the material other than mm. the resources of the artists themselves? Mm. Well, Basim, bingo. <laughs> yes, downtown archive. Yeah, New York, New York University has uh, built up this great um, archival collection called Downtown Archive, um, or especially around the the New York art scene in the nineteen eighties. And in fact. Uh, they have a collection of Martin Wong papers. Um, it, it's organized in different ways, but one category is uh, by artists. So when Martin um, moved away uh, from New York in 1994 when he became ill, um, and oh, actually it was after he died because his papers were uh, under the custody of a very good friend, and when he died, the decision was made to donate it to the downtown collection. So in fact, there are two great um, photo collages that he made based on the snapshots that he took of Lower East Side, um, you know, the tenement buildings and whatnot. Um, so before he made paintings, he actually put these photos together into collages and those were borrowed from um, the Martin Wong paper collection in um, it's called Fails Library Special Collections at the New York University. So that was definitely one of the most important sources. Um, there is another place that we haven't been able to actually uh, access very easily for political reasons, but for many years, um, especially in the 80s into the early 90s, exactly during the time that these artists were there, uh, there was a, a, a you know very much like a kind of Hole in the wall startup place called Asian American Art Center, um, which and then the director uh, basically approached every single artist who is of any kind of Asian heritage um, to do anything, you know, in its center and was very important um, place. But uh, but time has changed, right? I mean, you know, as you know very well, the uh, this idea of multiculturalism, this idea of artists of particular ethnicity or race organizing themselves into that group while also uh, thinking of themselves as um, a kind of comrades in many ways uh, was a very common thing in the 80s and early 90s but the time has really changed so this kind of very ethnic and racial uh, these specific kind of organizations of arts have really lost grounds in many ways um, in the, since the late 90s on. So for that reason, it became quite political to access a certain kind of materials. Um, and then what other am I thinking about? Oh yeah, um, touching, uh, again, uh, even though you know, he really um, wasn't in a, uh, it wasn't an easy situation for him to begin this you know, very um, ambitious performance projects at the beginning, but there was a small group of community of artists and curators around him who were very supportive, um, such as um, there is a very important organization called Exit Art, um, which just closed after 30 years of run, and it was one of the first organizations to give him support. Um, and their archive hasn't been organized, but I was able to look into some of the stuff um, of early projects that they did with him. So, you know, there, we were kind of pulling things um, uh, as we could have access to, on top of talking to the artists themselves. Anyone other than Boston? <laughs> Well, you don't have to. <laughs> I mean, don't feel obliged. Okay, so thank you very much.
Uh, it was a really, really interesting talk. Um, and the opening for this exhibition, the one upstairs, is happening in the cafe behind, so maybe some people can stay and have more conversations. Sure. Okay, thank you for coming. Thank you very much.